So I have a big announcement. No one else knows this yet. I'm going to run for a seat in the US Senate. And I figured this would be a great time to test my campaign slogan. Are you ready to help me? OK. Less peace, less health, fewer happy marriages. Vote for me, I will grow the economy. Oh, you like it? No, you don't. <laughs> no, only a crazy person would like that. Because who really wants less peace, worse health, and fewer happy marriages? But here's the thing. Speaking as an economist, those things, um, peace and health and happy marriages, they don't grow the economy. And we want to grow the economy, right? War is better for the economy than peace is. Sickness is substantially better for the economy than health is. And divorce, way better for the economy than a happy marriage. In fact, arguably, the most patriotic thing you can do is get really sick, hopefully chronically so, get at least one divorce, but hopefully more, and or start a war. <laughs> so get to it, people. <laughs> the fact that this is true makes me think that there is something fundamentally wrong with how we measure prosperity, how we measure progress, how we measure our economy. But let's take a step back to try and understand how we got to this crazy place in the first place. The beginning of the story is in 1922, when an immigrant from Belarus moved to the United States of America. Simon Kuznets was a lover of numbers, a true economist, and he worked for the US Department of Commerce. And he has been called one of the greatest inventors of the 20th century. Because he, in 1937, invented a number that is used all over the world. And that number is GDP, Gross Domestic Product. This is the elegant equation that was that amazing invention. This is how we measure gross domestic product. And this, my friends, is what we mean when we say we want to grow our economy. The one thing we all seem to agree on, right? This, our economy concept, is not amorphous. It is not uncertain. It is this number. So let me talk to you really briefly on this Saturday afternoon as I make you do math. I want to talk to you about why it is the case that war is better than peace. Well, war increases government spending. An increase in that part of the equation, bam! GDP has grown. We have a better economy. Let's take health. If you get really sick, you will need to buy the services of doctors and nurses. That's consumption. You will need to buy medicine hopefully for the rest of your life, that's a lot of consumption. So that's how sickness helps grow our economy. And then finally, divorce. Divorce really grows our economy because there's a heck of a lot of consumption going on when you have to have two separate houses, two separate fridges, two separate TVs, two separate grocery bills, not to mention the lawyer's fees, right? So divorce, certainly good for the economy because the economy is GDP, and this equation is what we're talking about. So let me ask you this question. If we don't want to grow war, sickness, divorce, what do we want to grow? What do you flowers. want more of? We've got flowers. <laughs> yes, thank you. Keep thinking about this question as I talk, because I think answering this question will change our economy 
and what we call our economy forever. I want to walk you into this land. I like to call it GDP land. And in this land, there's a seven-year-old little girl, or little boy, you have your own imaginations, and they live in an apartment, and they desperately want to go and play outside. But it is not safe for them to do so, because the air in their city is too polluted. So, because of this polluted air, their family needs to buy air purifiers to make it safe to breathe the air in their house. Cha-ching! Consumption! An air purifier is great for the economy. Then, when they actually want to leave the building and maybe walk to school, they all need to wear masks because that's what makes the air safe to breathe. Hopefully, they buy disposable masks because cha-ching, cha-ching, lots of consumption, lots of growing the economy. So that leads me to say that another seven-year-old little boy or girl living in what I like to call prosperity land, a land where they can just run out and play whenever they want, and they live in a safe neighborhood, and they have healthy parents. That child in prosperity land, according to our economic measurement, is living in a worse world than the child that lives in the apartment in the polluted city. So I ask you again, what do we want to grow? I think that I want to let you into this little secret. We're not the first people to realize that GDP kind of sucks at measuring prosperity. <laughs> we're not. In fact, we're in great company. We have Simon Kuznets, remember the inventor? Um, he himself, the inventor, has said that GDP is not meant to be used as a measurement for well-being. He did not intend it to be used as a measure for prosperity. He wrote that in his report to Congress. And in fact, in the 1940s, he quit his job at the US Department of Commerce because the Congress would not allow him to change the GDP equation to include non-paid housework. Because Dr. Kuznets says, hello, these stay-at-home moms and dads are doing a lot of stuff that adds to our prosperity. And Congress said, no, nope, we're just going to stick with this equation, thanks. <coughs> so the inventor of GDP decided to step away. Not only that, we have more recent things. In 2006, China invented green GDP because they saw GDP was lacking. In 2009, Nicolas Sarkozy, the president of France, commissioned a report by two Nobel Prize winning economists. And they said that we are mismeasuring our lives, that we have a GDP fetish. In 2010, Prime Minister David Cameron said that the, the UK is now going to measure happiness and the economy. And in 2012, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, said this, we should seek better and more direct measurements of economic well-being, which is the ultimate goal of our policy decisions. I saved what I think to be one of the most powerful critiques for the last on this list. It is from 1968, and it is from Bobby Kennedy. And he said this, GDP does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything, in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. So my friends, we are in good company. 
So this is not a pie in the sky, out there critique. We're talking about people who are powerful, agreeing with us. Yet, GDP has been measuring our prosperity for over 80 years now. Why is this the case? Is it because there are no alternatives developed? Nope. There are lots of alternatives out there. In fact, it's thrilling how many people are thinking about this. There's the Genuine Progress Indicator. There's the Happy Planet Index. There's the country of Bhutan, which measures gross national happiness. There's the UN Human Development Index. And of course, there's China's green GDP. So there are plenty of alternatives out there. So why haven't we changed it? I believe we haven't changed it because we, the public, the society, are not talking about what we want to grow. We're talking about growing the economy, and we don't really know what it means. So, I want you to consider, why is it even important what we measure? Why does it matter? Why does it matter that we're measuring GDP and that GDP does not reflect what we want to grow? I'll tell you why. Because the game of GDP growth is the global game. That's the game we play. We want to have the fastest growing GDP and the highest GDP, even if it means that there's environmental destruction and societal sickness all over the place. I don't think that's the game we really want to play. Do you? So I ask you one more time, and I invite you to truly consider, what do we want to grow? What do we desire more of? What do you desire more of in your life? Because ultimately, that's what the economy is here for. The economy, collectively, is about what we all desire to grow, what we all desire more of. And I think that the reason we haven't changed our measurement is because we, all of us in this room, haven't been talking about it. So we need to choose what we measure, and we have the power to do that. We get to choose what we grow. We get to make what matters to us count. I think by having these conversations, we can alter the path of human history. I think you talking about what you truly want to grow can be the spark that causes the economic transformation that we've been waiting for. So get talking.